Welcome, thanks for coming today. Uh, my name's Keith Gillis. I'm Dean of the College of Natural Resources here at Berkeley. Um, on behalf of the organizers, I'm really honored to welcome you all and kick off this event with Secretary Karen oh, Ross. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Berkeley Food Institute, which was created to serve as an interdisciplinary hub at UC Berkeley to bring together all of the people across the campus working on food and agriculture issues. Uh, the Berkeley Food Institute is supporting and undertaking programs to catalyze transformative change in food systems, and we feel we're already making an impact in that regard. Co-sponsors of today's event include the School of Public Health, uh, the Matsui Center for Government Relations, and the college. Um, really, one of the main functions of the BFI, and my goal is one of the founding deans in getting it organized, but trying not to make it just a CNR entity, was to facilitate linkage between research and education programs at Berkeley with policymakers and policy processes. Um, we're pleased that state leaders uh, actually think that's our purpose as well because I take Karen's presence here today as one indication of that, um, that we're trying all of us together to address the critical policy challenges and opportunities for California's agricultural sector and its food systems. I'm honored today to be able to introduce Gl Dr. Glinda Humiston, Vice President of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources of the University of California, who will uh, in turn introduce Secretary Ross and lead the discussion later. Uh, Glenda is the Vice President who served uh, our President Clinton as the Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resources and the uh, Environment at USDA from 1998 to 2001. In 2009, she was appointed by President Obama to serve as the California Director, uh, as California State Director at the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, in the Rural Development Division. She's earned her PhD here at Berkeley uh, in environmental science policy and management under uh, a major professor that I can't locate the name of, um, <laughs> where her dissertation was focused on the U.S. Farm Bill and attempts to make uh, policy reformations in the Farm Bill. Uh, please help me welcome Glenda today, who will introduce Secretary Ross. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, I thought you were going to make that joke you made uh, a couple weeks ago about how I went from being your graduate student to your boss in six years. So, so those of you in the audience, you never know what's coming down the road. <laughs> yeah, 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 be good to your students. That's for you professors out there. <laughs> But uh, it's really great to work with Keith and everybody else here on campus, and I'm really excited to be here for the Berkeley Food Institute. It's, uh, it's one of those brilliant ideas that was probably long overdue, putting together the several different schools working together. And, and that's what we're finding increasingly, is the need for this interdisciplinary approach to solving our issues. Um, because of that, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Karen Ross is another person who really puts a lot of value on that interdisciplinary approach. Um, and she's shown that throughout her career. Uh, she's, she's a teeny bit less of a California native than me. Uh, I moved here in 1986 and she came in 89, but she and I both have worked all over the state in a variety of things. Um, I first met Karen in the 90s when she was executive director, CEO of the uh, California Association of Wine Grape Growers, where she exhibited some extremely amazing leadership skills that ultimately led to uh, the specialty crop title in the Farm Bill. No, no small feat, believe me, because that was quite a fight that a lot of people were involved in. <clears throat> uh, because of that work, she was asked by President Obama to serve as Chief of Staff to Secretary Tom Vilsack at USDA, where I also had the pleasure of working with her uh, for several years at, at, during my appointment at USDA, too. But she got, um, she got tempted back to California when Governor Brown asked her to take on being Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And in that role, I too have had the pleasure of watching her really reach out to a wide array of stakeholders. Um, one of the very first things was to put together a state federal team to look at things like dairy digesters, really crucial topic that nobody was paying any attention to until Karen stepped up to the plate. 
So I could go on and on. There's many stories just like that where her leadership has really helped us find solutions and move uh, items forward. Today, she's going to give us her thoughts about some items uh, of opportunity related to food systems. And I'm looking forward to hearing her comments. And following that, uh, she and I will do a little dialogue back and forth and then open it up to the audience for some questions. And we're real excited to have uh, you all here today to help us. So please help me welcome Karen Ross. So now you know too much about me. <laughs> Only Karen Ross would immediately, in her first few weeks on the job, convene a digester working group. <laughs> I mean, cow poop matters when you have almost two million cows in the state, right? So now we've got that out of the way. I don't have to talk about dairy digester technology anymore, do I? OK, OK. So um, I'm really excited to be here. And any opportunity I have to come to a college campus, I do partly because I want to live my life vicariously through you. I am so jealous of the opportunities you have before you, partly because we have so many challenges before us. But when I think about what you are going to do for this world, I am so excited and so confident of what our world is going to be like because of you, the students, and the faculty, and the staff that supports you. I hope that when I get done talking about just a few of the things that we're working on currently at the Department of Food and Agriculture as part of Governor Brown's administration, you'll be as excited about the multitude of opportunities before you that I am myself. Um, first of all, I know how lucky I am to have the position that I have. I am a farm girl from western Nebraska I did the non-traditional route of seven and a half years of night school after I had been in the workforce for a while to get my degree in English. So obviously, I'm qualified for this job just like I was qualified to be the president of California Wine Grape Growers because there's so many wineries in Nebraska, right? It, 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 for me, it is an example of finding out what you love and doing that and being able to craft things around that and being adaptable in the way that you go about it. I worked very hard to get off the farm and tell my dad I wasn't going to marry a farmer, I wasn't going to stay in the western part of Nebraska, and I wasn't going to be in agriculture. And it was from the time I left the farm that it called to me, and I feel very fortunate that I still own part of our family farm that my brother farms for me. But coming from an agricultural system like that in Nebraska, to a state like California, it's like, pinch me, I really do get to live this life. In this state where we grow 400 different kinds of crops, and because we've been blessed with the natural resources and the Mediterranean climate that's one of the few in the world, and hopefully that'll still be that way with climate change, that allows us to do the diversity of crops that we have with the quality that we do them on an almost year-round basis, and that diversity of our cropping systems and all of the farmers and the ranchers that make it up is a strength that is unparalleled. What we grow in this state cannot be easily duplicated across the country. There's a reason that almonds are the word most associated with the California drought, and my almond friend growers wish that I would stop repeating that statistic. It's because we have a strategic advantage with some of the most nutrient-dense plant-based crops that are grown in the United States, and some of them are grown in very few other places around the world. Almonds, walnuts, pistachios, the whole family of grapes, whether it's table grapes, raisins, juice grapes, or wine grapes. We are the world's fourth largest wine producer, one state, fourth largest wine producer. Specialty citrus, the berry crops, and dairy. California is home to 20% of all the milk that is produced, which is why we have so many cows, why, which is why there's that waste stream that we're figuring out innovative ways of taking care of it. What matters for California agriculture, and I feel very passionately that we are at a crossroads now, is can we keep doing this, not necessarily in the same way, but how do we build on the improvements that we've done? You know, we're California. We are the home of Alice Waters, who's had a huge impact on foods and the way consumerism is about foods and driving trends in food and wine and just enjoying mealtimes together. We are also home of Cesar Chavez, 
who absolutely awakened a generation to the people who work so hard in our farm fields to bring it to us. And along the way, we've had a couple of famous farmers. Most of them tend to be in the wine industry, Robert Mondavi, Ernest, and Julio Gallo. It's just a couple of global brand names when it comes to the farming side of it. But in this state, because we had things like the UFW, we do have laws in this state that have improved the working conditions. Is there more to be done? Yes. But in this state, we have taken extraordinary steps because we know how fortunate we are, but we are still an agricultural sector that's extremely hands-on agriculture. It's a lot of specialized work, and as much as we're working on anybody who's in ag engineering on robotics and sensor technology, that artisan touch of the hands that touch so many of our crops is something that we're going to need. And so really thinking through the workforce of the future in the fields, in the processing plants, and throughout the food chain is obviously a critical place for us to go. I spend a lot of my time on environmental issues, even though my department does not have the statutory authority over so many of the laws and regulations that directly impact farming. But think about what we have done in this state. Anyone who comes from the Central Valley or the LA Basin knows that for a fact in this country on any given day of the year, either the LA Basin or the Central Valley of California will have the nation's worst air quality. And yet we've made tremendous improvements on that air quality. Many of them around lots of different sectors, but especially the agricultural sector and how we farm and the equipment we use there, that's nothing like what the farmers of Nebraska have to do. Now they'll often say, I know it's gonna come our way sooner or later, but just don't let it happen too soon. We've replaced engines. We've got cost share programs to improve dust control, and we've taken PM10 down to 2.5, and people are working on how to make additional improvements there. Dairy digester technology will be an important piece of addressing air quality as well as water quality. We are the only state that has 100% use reporting for our pesticides. We're the only state that has Prop 65 that is about labeling if you're intentionally introducing certain chemicals, and it's a very active law today that most manufacturers are looking for ways to reformulate as opposed to, especially now with the interest in natural and clean products, of avoiding those kinds of additives. We are a state that has come to grips with nitrates in groundwater. Now, it's been a 20-year struggle. Um, a report that was written 20 years ago led the way to a University of California report that was released again three years ago but we are putting very stringent regulatory requirements in place so that our farmers are thinking more intentionally about how they use fertilizing materials, how they are using irrigation water, A, to mitigate any pollution into the groundwater basin, and over time, can we come up with the technologies to remediate and clean up those groundwater basins? So again, it comes back to the, to the application of dairy digesters, getting those nitrates away from the groundwater basins, how we use any of our fertilizing materials. And leading to that is our implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, another watershed act that has been characterized as the biggest change in California water law in 100 years. 121 of our 500 water basins that are over, over prescribed that will have to come into a sustainable yield over a 20-year period of time. Now, many people are very critical about that 20-year period of time, but this hasn't happened overnight, and it takes time to put them into balance, but there are very prescriptive timelines for getting the governance agency in place, for putting together this sustainable groundwater management plan that is deemed adequate, with a check-in by the Department of Water Resources every five years to make sure it's on track to achieve sustainable yields. It's a huge new area where some of what we need to know we don't have today. We need a lot of modeling. And one of the most crucial elements of this is that all of the stakeholders within that groundwater basin must come together as all the voices that depend on that water, whether it's for their drinking water, either running out of drinking water or not having access to clean drinking water in the state of California that shouldn't be of living there and the quality of life, and of course, farmers as a part of that who will be making decisions about what they farm, where they farm, 
how much is going to be followed. This is a huge social science exercise, and I have to quote my good friend Anthrop on this one, who years ago, uh, when I started working with her, said, you know, collaboration can be a very tedious and messy process, but at the end, by bringing all those perspectives to the table, you get richer, longer lasting, better results. Going through this is not going to be easy, but for the first time, the entities who are in charge of land use our boards of supervisors, and the water agencies who manage water, this notion of water use and land use are going to be married in a way that they haven't necessarily been before. Hugely important. On the topic of water, uh, maybe after this year, I won't have to put so many hours into drought meetings. Obviously, California agriculture has taken a big hit, but so has the California environment. We are showing our resiliency. We have communities cooperating in ways they haven't before. And it's very easy to look at, well, so California agriculture has $2.7 billion in growth that didn't happen. There's 17,000 farm jobs that didn't happen that normally would have. Um, there's 2.7 million acre feet of water that was not available, and there's 560,000 acres that have been fallowed that normally would be productive. And it's easy to gloss over that because Last year, California agriculture broke a new record for productivity, $54 billion in farm gate value, because the use of that water is being precisely used for the maximum economic return, which all of my ag economist friends say that's the way things should be. What that masks are those communities on the west side where they are overly dependent on the agricultural economy, we're not getting full-time and extra hours of work and a seasonal job makes a huge difference. That's why we worked as an administration on the California Water Action Plan that was released over a year ago to really think about all of the ways we make this molecule work for us. Conservation, what role each one of us has in understanding where our water comes from, how we're using it, and how it is a precious commodity. Let's all have a new ethic of conservation. Recycled water, where can it be used safely? Where do we absolutely have to use potable water for potable water uses because of public health and safety? But really unleashing technology and innovation around the use of recycled water for things that we can grow safely besides our landscaping or ways, new ways of purification so that we can have that. Stormwater capture, let's hope we have those opportunities this year. When we developed our regulations at the State Water Resources Control Board 15 years ago, stormwater was a waste. Get it off the property as quickly as possible. And now we're thinking like, bring every gallon of that back. Let's capture it, let's use it. Really thinking about our whole watershed management approach and the connectivity of what's happening in the upper watershed and what that means for the valley floor. What kinds of restoration projects make sense for that? Improving our groundwater management, which the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act will definitely demand, is a part of that. I'm going to shift before I have some dialogue with Glenda, and more importantly, we get to answer some of your questions, or try to, to climate. Huge, huge topic. It's another reason I feel so fortunate to work for Governor Brown, because in California, we're talking about climate change. We're acting on it. We just released a couple of months ago an update on adaptation, safeguarding California. There's a full chapter there that was written by my department based on a specialty crop consortium that we convened four years ago to really look at the research needs, the adaptation needs, the mechanical needs, as well as the landscape needs for agriculture in California to be here and continue to thrive. That is a very significant report. I encourage you all to take a look at that. But what I'm especially excited about now is the update that we're doing looking at California climate change strategies beyond 2030. Earlier this year, the governor challenged all of us around his goals, which is to reduce our petroleum use by 50%, to improve the building efficiency of all of our buildings by 50%, to make sure that at least 50% of our energy use is based on renewables, and the one that I'm especially excited about is a strategy of preserving natural working landscapes and incorporating practices to store carbon on the landscapes. This whole notion of conserving farmland as a climate strategy is fairly new. 
and being able to quantify what those benefits are, are going to be critical to generate the cap and trade auction funds that can come in to expanding that program to go beyond conservation easements and other types of tools to really preserve farmland and harden our urban boundaries. But also the third tier of that program is about practices that we can put in place that can mitigate climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and store carbon. Things like no-till conservation practices are a no-brainer. But one of the initiatives the governor asked us to lead the charge on this year is our Healthy Soils Initiative, announced in 2015, the year of the International Soils Initiative. I'm so excited about all the new stakeholders that have come to the department around this Healthy Soils Initiative, of really understanding that this veneer that we've been walking on Earth for thousands and thousands of years, there's still a lot we don't understand, but we know that it is the secret to everything that gives us life. And understanding how we can build up that organic matter to improve our resiliency for drought and climate is a hugely exciting new frontier. And it is an opportunity for us to partner with the research communities, with Cooperative Extension, and with you to really think about those systems and by focusing on our healthy soils, what does that mean for our biodiversity, our wildlife habitat, water retention on our <coughs> soils, pollinator health, all of those kinds of things. I'm convinced that this one initiative is going to bring together the kind of multidisciplinary approach that we need and coming at the time we need it most, at a time where the population is growing rapidly and more significantly, the demand for food is being driven by the rapid growth of middle income demographics around the globe. 1.1 billion people that can have discretionary income and with that extra dollar they want to feed their family better. They want their food to be safe and they want it to be healthy and nutritious. And it is something that we can do well here, not just for the citizens of the globe who will grow to 9 billion people by the year 2050, but for our people here at home in our state where some of our biggest pockets of poverty and obesity and juvenile diabetes and food insecure households are in some of our most productive agricultural communities. We can figure this stuff out. We can figure out how to use water better and smarter and survive future droughts. We can figure out the technology to make sure there's no longer waste in our vocabulary. It's just a byproduct that we put into a different revenue stream for closed loop systems. We can figure out how to feed people in schools where they work and in their communities better food. We can do it here in California because despite all those great soils and the water system that we have and the climate we have, our best asset is our people and the DNA that we have in the state to innovate, to solve problems, to go, oh, that's what we need to do. We're not afraid of a couple of failures along the way. We can come together and solve these. And that's why, at the end of the day, I am so jealous of you as students and the opportunities you have to really address the grand, grand challenges of our time and for our planet. If we can solve this water problem, it is, for me, the number one, well, with climate change, I better remember who I work for. Climate change and water are the two grandest challenges for the security of our planet in the 21st century and will absolutely dictate how we live going into the 22nd century. You are part of a fabulous public research institute that has answered these kinds of problems for the ages. And it is because of the assets you have here, intellectual as well as infrastructure, that I am so optimistic that California agriculture will continue to thrive. It will continue to create opportunities for more people, large and small, organic, conventional. It will be here as an important part of our state, not just because that's our history, but because we want every citizen to have access to healthy California-grown food at the end of the day. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And Glenda, let's get some dialogue going here.
Well, that was excellent, Karen. I uh, always love listening to you speak. <laughs> so um, bear with me as I set up a kind of complex question, because you touched on several issues here around technology, new practices, ag in California mm -hmm. in the future. And uh, I want to tie those to the labor question in, in two ways. Okay. Um, there's been some studies recently showing polls that have taken place down in Mexico and mm -hmm. Latin America showing that young people there, and the, the, the graph was like this, mm -hmm. have no interest in coming here to do farm work, right. which means um, a source of farm labor that California farmers have relied upon for decades mm -hmm. is, is disappearing. Mm -hmm. A huge issue already, going to get worse. The flip side of that is obviously ag technology mm -hmm. and new practices, new ways to do business. Uh, in fact, I was, I was touring the, the Kearney Ag Experiment Station a week or so ago, and among the many miraculous things they showed us, it was amazing, very exciting, um, one thing kind of blew all of us away. Uh, a, a, a new variety of grape that allows the grapes to dry on the vine mm -hmm. into raisins mm -hmm. that can be mechanically harvested. That's gonna be out in a year or two. Yep. And when it's out, overnight, 30 to 40,000 jobs mm -hmm related to raisin grapes are gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess ha uh, it, by the same token that we don't, we don't want to expect people to do our back-breaking labor for us, how do we deal with that social upheaval moving forward of, of the big shifts as ag technology comes on, sure. labor demands change? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I don't think we've done a very good job of uh, especially as consumers have gotten further and further away from their food source, is really appreciating and respecting that backbreaking work. And, and we've done that in other segments of our um, business economy as well. Um, but, but the fact is that the workforce in agriculture um, is aging itself. And so just to extend the working life of people um, and, and the kinds of crazy things that we have to do, it, we should have been doing this kind of research earlier. And you know, there are some universities that actually got out of ag engineering for a while because they didn't see mechanization after we did the tomato harvester as something that was really gonna work. And part of that was driven by the 60s where USDA had a policy for 25 years that they would not do funding of, of mechanization that would replace these jobs. Well, that was pretty short-sighted, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think there's several pieces to this. One is that we need to give this work the due that, it's, that it deserves. We've never created career ladders in the field. I mean, we can say all we want to about the fast food sector, but oftentimes that's been a pathway to get into fine dining establishments. At least there's a pathway to move up and do different things. We haven't been as good at doing that in the field of moving up. Um, but the processing plants themselves have gone significantly towards robotics and sensor technology. So people aren't doing that backbreaking work. And so you've lost some jobs there, but the jobs that are remaining are in a computer centralized room that's running everything on the floor from computers. Those are better jobs. And they're certainly better for your back. Those are the kinds of jobs that are being created out of this. And in the meantime, we have to do transition stuff. I happen to believe that urban farming is gonna be an important part of our future. There's more farming that's gonna happen inside, vertical farming. Those are different kinds of jobs for people who haven't had the chance to get an education but really wanna work with their hands and bring that skills to it. And I also dream that as we progress on the Sustainable Ag Land Conservation Program, we think smartly about how do we harden that urban boundary and maybe that land is available for new farmers or veteran farmers, or young farmers who want to get their start up, and they really want to sell to the chefs, to the specialty crops, to the farmers markets within those cities, and we're creating that hardened boundary there, you know, a nice little ring of organic farms all around the city. So really thinking through, we haven't been holistic in thinking through, there's so many job opportunities that we haven't articulated well, or been intentional about programs that would help people move into something in ag that's slightly different. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, so to help create those jobs and opportunities with the smaller scale, organic, niche mm -hmm. markets, um, there's gonna have to be a lot of tools available to help move that forward. 
Uh, a couple that you didn't okay. mention in your talk that mm -hmm. I know you have some control over, uh, California Grown, mm -hmm. which is helping farmers do marketing. Mm -hmm. And also, a uh, great deal of interest, I'm sure, in the audience, so I'll, I'll preclude at least one question here, TPP, um, the, the big mm -hmm. trade agreement. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks think that's only for big, giant farmers, mm -hmm. and yet increasingly we're seeing uh, more and more small, medium-scale farmers, mm -hmm. particularly those that do a little processing mm -hmm. of their own, vertically integrate, yeah. uh, actually accessing these foreign markets. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, CDFA does a lot of training mm -hmm. for small, mm -hmm. medium-scale farmers. Can you maybe talk about California Grown and what you're doing in trade issues? Sure. Um, so um, from an agricultural perspective, I think there's a lot of benefit for this. I mean, it's, what's it, 1,800 tariffs that are removed, some markets that will be open for the first time. And when you look at the rapid growth of the world population and less arable land, less available water, just the constraints on the resources, trade will be a part of this. And I don't think the trade has to come to the exclusion of those of us who would prefer to just have all local agriculture. It's giving us that choice in the marketplace, but it's allowing job creation and revenues to be generated. And we do focus a lot on small and mid-sized businesses, it's not like you have to put everything into an export market, but it's a way of diversifying your risk in your portfolio. And so we think that's, uh, we think that's really, really important. Um, you also didn't mention our specialty crop block grant program, which has helped, as well as the programs at rural development. You know, I always wish for all of the small farms that they are successful and can be like some of our fourth and fifth generation farm families who all of a sudden, instead of having one family dependent upon making their living on that farm, they've either had to grow in acres or vertically integrate so they can support another family and then the family after that and 32 cousins sitting around the board meeting can get complex, but if you're successful, you will grow and rural development has been a great pathway with some of your value added grants for people to really think about the food the food part of the food system and how they want to play a role in that with those kinds of assistance dollars. You're reminding me that uh, one oh, of the... Can I also sure. say? Organic. Organic is such an important part of California. We're about 40% of all that's being sourced. The growth trends for this, I mean, it's unbelievable. Even in the midst of the recession, they were double-digit growth. They're continuing to grow like that. And organic, I mean, we've worked so hard to bring some harmonization on some of the standards. Um, and I know my friends at CCOF who traveled with me to China are still working on that. There's tremendous demand for organic on a, on a global basis too. So there's, you know, it's like there's a diversity of choices here and that's really important from a business point of view. Absolutely. You're reminding me of, of a grant we uh, Rural Development actually gave a couple years ago that was to one of the Centers for International Trade and Development to adapt the Step X program yeah. CDFA has on, on how to access foreign markets. We had them adapt it for uh, small scale farmers in the San Joaquin Valley to access the Los Angeles market, uh, which in that, many yes. ways is more that, complex yes. than actually accessing a foreign market, uh, in many ways because of permits and regs right. and things. Um, <clears throat> the Los Angeles Food Policy Council has mm -hmm. been a real big partner in yes. that, as have some other cities around the state. Yeah. What do you see big cities being able to do to be more helpful uh, it's, in it's this kind of... It's huge. We have, I think, 31 local food policy councils now, which is broad-based stakeholder groups coming around local food systems, food deserts, food security issues. Um, our piece in that, we um, have established a farm-to-fork office, but our singular focus in this initial days of not having very much funding is farm-to-school, you know, with those extra six cents that came about through the authorization of the Childhood Nutrition Act for school lunch programs and the new nutritional guidelines for that. Huge, huge opportunity for farmers to sell into the school systems. We've just created a cyberspace farmers market because the food nutrition directors didn't know how to connect with the farmers, especially for those people who really wanted to source more locally and see what kind of volume do you have at this time of the year so we can do some planning around that. It sounds easier than it is and some of the institutional procurement policies that the LA Food Policy Council did have been very informative to that. So that's an area that we're working on a lot. But the other one in this state where there's tremendous opportunity is also partnering with the Kaisers and the Setter Homes and just looking at the shift to personalized health care and more importantly under the Affordable Care Act, we're shifting 
from heads and beds is how you get them reimbursed to preventing diseases, which is all the food crops that we have, and keeping heads out of bed and really working with those institutions for their buying as well as, you know, in Northern California, Kaiser has farmers markets in most of their facilities. So there's a lot of opportunities that create additional marketing opportunities for small farmers. Their biggest challenge is they can farm or they can spend all their time going to farmers markets, but there's, there's small farmers and how do we work that out? But aggregation and hubs are gonna be a piece of that. Well, and actually build on that a little bit because part of the problem is, is for these institutional buyers, um, you, you have to have those aggregation type hubs to make it feasible. Yeah. And yet for years now, we've had a problem. We just can't make them pencil out as a business. Yeah. Um, there's been attempts to partner them up with mm -hmm. food banks. Mm -hmm. There's been attempts to form cooperatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's been a variety of attempts there, but it's still a it's, big, thorny it's problem. A but I bet there's some brains in this room that could help us figure it out. That's what, that's what I'm hoping, because it still has been a challenge. Um, a cooperative model has probably been the closest to being um, successful on that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's been any other unusual examples of that. But there's something about how do we take the efficiency but on a smaller scale and make it work so that the consumers feel good about where it's being sourced from. The farmers don't have to spend all their time and their gas money to get to markets. Um, I was really sad that one of our members of the State Board of Food and Agriculture, who was the original Mr. Salad Bar in schools, Rodney Taylor, left Riverside Unified School District and is now in Fairfax County because he was pursuing working with that community. He felt schools were perhaps the best infrastructure to be an aggregator hub. And he was really putting together you know, some stakeholder groups to come up with that kind of a concept and see if schools on a year-round basis where they've got the assets could be deployed more efficiently. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done in this space, and I think it's a perfect time to be doing it. Yeah, actually, there's been discussions recently about the need to uh, look at things like aggregation hubs, the whole distribution system, not just for institutional buyers, but, but for things for like farmers markets. You, you know, yeah. w one of the yeah. kind of dirty <laughs> little secrets out there is that farmers markets have the worst carbon footprint of any aspect of the food system, much as we all love our farmers markets. How are we going to move forward on something like that? Well, um, as, as long as it's farmers coming together and doing that, because unfortunately we oversee the farmers market program, the certified farmers market program, and we oftentimes, because there's been so much growth and everybody wants a local farmers market, uh, there have been examples of too many people stopping at a warehouse and loading up and bringing it in, so we're the enforcers of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a, it, it's a challenge, but this is the importance of removing the gap between farmers and consumers so that we understand what our buying patterns are driving mm -hmm. and how that has an impact and rethinking some of those ways of doing that. But just think of the number of specialty stores and even big box stores nowadays or regular chain stores who are featuring more and more local. You know, they want organic, but they also want local. So there's mm -hmm. other ways of bringing this to a marketplace. And right. hopefully the farmer is getting the full amount that they need to be successful and keep farming. So I'm going to do two more questions, okay. and then we're going to open great. it up to the audience. But I, I have to bring up drought. Uh, of because, course you do. Because, you know, it's raining, and it's supposed to be an El Nino year, lots of rain, and there's a big fear out there that too much of the, the more scientifically illiterate public are going to think, oh, the drought is solved. And you and I and probably everybody in this room knows that's not true. Right. So, so how are we going to work with policymakers and the public to make sure they know this is something we've got to keep right. looking at? So it's a, it's a big focus of the drought task force and our messaging and the water agencies themselves. And I think we can look at the Los Angeles, Southern California example from the drought in 89 through 93. They have been somewhat resilient um, in this drought because starting 20 years ago, they invested in conservation, they invested in toilet replacements, they invested in groundwater remediation, they invested in water purification. Um, and so they had a whole suite of things, including some new storage facilities for the regional scale. That's a lesson we can all learn, and I have heard it over and over again. Do not allow any of us to go back to our pre-drought mm -hmm. actions because we know that with climate change, we will have more frequent droughts, more extended droughts, and so it's going to be up to all of us to 
um, think differently about our water and what are we doing on a regional scale to improve our resiliency to drought. Um, and, and the other thing is that we're very focused on being able to capture any, any storm water, any additional water on our lands and being able to hold that as a way people are getting very acutely aware of what can I do for deep percolation to help start recharging my groundwater basin and that's a very positive sign. So um, my last question, and I can't resist because you uh, mentioned a couple times how jealous you were of the I audience. I am so jealous. I'm so old. <clears throat> so, <laughs> well, you know. I'm jealous on a whole bunch of fronts. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to push back on that because it was only a few years ago I did my PhD, and, and you know, and I'm I'm not I'm about your age too. So, I'm going to say Keith Gillis is going to offer you to come here and do a PhD. <laughs> My question is, my I'll, question I'll be talking is, to you. <laughs> oh, he loves us oddball students. He's known for that. <laughs> um, my question to you is, what is the title of your dissertation going to be? Oh, good Lord. Oh, my God. All the things you've worked on, what, what would you have the most passion to dig in really deep on? Oh my God, I have so many interests. That's like, and I love food so much. I, I guess what really captures my imagination is that as we go back to understanding nutrition and its role in our health, it would be something about the intersection of how do we, starting at very young ages, have children know what it takes to grow it, how to cook it, and how to enjoy it as part of a healthy lifestyle that will be with you forever. That there's nothing better than a great meal with some good wine and some great food. But there's also something about those quiet family dinners mm -hmm. that, that it, it, it creates a, a, a value about sharing with people that matters. So I guess it goes back to my 4-H kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I would probably be around that nexus. I well, think it's well, so, so even if it's not a dissertation, it certainly sounds like a book you should be thinking about. <laughs> With that, I want to see if we've got a few questions Any in questions, the audience. Please, I'm sure there's for got Glenda. to be. Send them all to Glenda. There's one right there. <laughs> right there. So I, I appreciate that, and I think the mechanical piece of this is one piece of it, but I think that um, the diversity in our landscape that is already happening, but that's why we're investing so much in soil health, which with, with the land use and water thing coming together, I think we'll continue to see that kind of diversity of what, what is the carrying capacity of our soil, what is the carrying capacity of our water system. So I, I didn't mean to make it sound like that is the only solution. I think that is one piece of it, though. Right here. I might also want to add a piece that malnourished farm families on all the different planets around the world, I mean subsistence agriculture and, and giving people tools for sustainable agriculture where they are is also, I mean that's the international development piece of this and being able to work with those farm, farmers um, to be able to feed their own families mm -hmm. with healthy food is really, really a critical missing piece. And, and I might add to that, though, um, I, I think one of the things the university system perhaps has fallen down mm -hmm. a little bit on is not enough research on sustainable ag practices and, and the technologies yeah. that support that small and medium scale farmer. Um, that is something we're trying to turn around. But, 
as you mentioned, yeah. in the last 20 years. Yeah. We've fallen down a little bit. And I'm looking at Paul Dolan because energy was an area that when we did the first round of assessments in the Sustainable Wine Growing Program, it just leaped off the page that so few wineries or farms had ever done an energy audit. Mm -hmm. And it's been it has been transformational of their move away from petroleum-based energy to renewable energies, biodiesel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a wake-up call, even processing what we do at nighttime. I mean, it was just transformational. So the first step is education and then doing something about it. Yeah. Right there. So thank you for the opportunity. Let me see if I, if I can articulate this question well. So we're talking about uh, climate change. We're talking about the TPP which I don't know what we're talking about because as far as I know it has not been released to the public. Yeah, the text was released last Thursday. Okay, it so I online. need to get info, I need to uh, inform myself better about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear there are some concerns regarding environmental uh, regulations on the TPP in the sense that uh, the right uh, for to maximize profit, the, the right for profit uh, is going to be protected over environmental protections. So you mentioned that right now we have two million cows in California. You also mentioned that the middle class is growing. The middle class worldwide is growing and changing the diets, their diets, uh, meaning in great part eating more meat and eating more animal products. So if, if we're thinking about water, the, uh, a cow, uh, the water embedded in a cow is, is great, it's huge, right? So if, the, if a so-called free market is going to determine what is going to be grown in California, and uh, people are eating more cows and drinking more milk, uh, products that are water intensive, so how are we going to to be able to cope with that, with a higher demand for, for, for meat. And in the same thing, regard, regarding what Professor Altieri was mentioning, uh, how are we going to protect biodiversity if our strategy to produce food uh, is further mechanization, further industrialization, which means intensifying the monoculture system, which is the opposite of biodiversity. So the question is, how are we going to protect water with a higher demand for meat, and how are we going to protect biodiversity if our uh, agricultural system is based on monocultures and mechanization? So that, there's a lot of different answers to that, and I'm certainly not the expert, but one of the things that we know is that we cannot continue to farm the way we traditionally have, which is like, oh, there's a new market, let's tear up some more grassland, forest, whatever it is, that we have to move agriculture into the, a smaller environmental footprint, which is water, which is fertilizer, f nutrients, and which is land. So that's like, and, and I agree with this. This is, we cannot grow by just tearing up more. We have to think smarter about what we're growing, where it's growing, and doing that as efficiently as possible, that's the only way I see to save some of the species in the world is that we can't keep burning forests. We can't keep tearing out the grasslands that keep getting torn out. The other thing is that, and I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with some of the recent decisions by the WHO. Now, my guess is that with regard to USDA nutritional guidelines, sustainability is not gonna get into it this time, but the fact that it's been asked, People in today's age, and a lot of it is driven by the demographics I'm looking at in this front seat, they look at health as something broader. It's health, healthy for me, healthy for my family, healthy for my community, healthy for the planet. And so I think that combination of things is going to drive food decisions and the fact that we have so much plant-based protein and could do more. Now, on the milk side of things, I think California's natural capacity has already been met because our cow numbers have started dropping. They've leveled off. The productivity per cow, which is a better use of resources, has maximized. And the technology of understanding all of the components of milk and where that nutrition is coming from and streaming that into how many protein bars or other food items 
list whey protein as the first, you know, being able to more efficiently get the real nutritional aspect into various markets will be some of the answers, but not the only answers. Yeah, and, and, and I also want to add to that that um, we've got to really step back on some of these more controversial questions and make sure we're looking at the whole system in a comprehensive way. I know lately the whole debate about meat is one that people just go, okay, let's get rid of meat, it's, it's awful. But <clears throat> there's a difference between the way we raise meat here in the U.S. in confined animal feeding mm -hmm. operations, feeding grain to ruminants who probably should never be fed grain, but, and, and requires antibiotics just to keep them alive when you're feeding them grain. You know, that's a system that has a lot of problems and deserves every kind of question you can raise about it. But you can't let that cause you to lose sight of the fact that when you look at the whole planet, 10 to 15 percent of the land mass is capable of, of intensive cultivation. About 40 to 50 percent of the land mass surface is capable of producing food through proper grazing by ruminants, which is what they ought to be doing. And I'm not talking cutting down trees in the Amazon rainforest for grazing. I'm talking grasslands that shouldn't be plowed, yeah. but could be grazed. Mm -hmm. In fact, in our own Sierra and Cascade system, grazing is an important tool to do fire prevention, as well as the California Native Plant Society will tell you how important grazing is in those particular ecosystems to give the native flora a chance uh, versus invasive species. So, so we've got to really think about the whole system when these kind of questions come up. Right there. Right there. The I'm wondering how you bring all these experts and all these industries together, especially since you have such a systems viewpoint, but others have very protected interests. Yeah, so that to me is one of the exciting opportunities now. We spend a lot of time at the department uh, on ecosystem services and really getting people to think about farming as this biological activity that's happening within a system and the food system itself. But, but then the convening, making sure you've got all the right perspectives brought together, that's one of the things that's been so cool about the, the Food Institute here at Berkeley is that it's bringing those multiple disciplines together to really help foster systems thinking, shared research objectives, which will then lead to the extension of that kind of results of that kind of work to more people. And it's really getting all of us out of our silos. We've gotten so efficient inside silos that we've forgotten about uh, the, the broader way of making connections. But that's, California is a state of connectivity, so let's figure it out. It's not gonna be easy though, because sometimes you don't even know who else you should have in the room, because they know something about something that could be the missing piece, it's right? It's <laughs> true. Right here. So um, thank you all so much for the conversation thus far. Um, and I heard you talk, both of you share up to this point, a little bit about food security and policies. And, and I appreciate the systems uh, perspective from a holistic view. So my question is going to be about food security. And I want to connect some of those. And I would love to hear your insights and then hopefully some strategies for action, which is at the moment, um, last week, I was at the University of Irvine at the National Food uh, Security Research Summit. Uh, we, we had some fascinating presentations about work that NASA is doing and measuring water across mm -hmm. a global context mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then measuring land water versus uh, the different levels. I didn't know how many different kinds of water there was until last week, which was fascinating. Took pictures of everything and I'm still studying it. So um, what, I, what I wanted to ask you is, so there's competing interests with like market demand and then there's this conversation around food waste and then there's conversation about food security, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So my question to you all is, so at the moment, um, I have the privilege of doing work with regards to food security amongst UC students. Mm -hmm. So the UC system has 10 campuses, about one in every five students is food insecure at the moment, right? And the UC system has arguably the least amount of need given that the CSU system and the community college yeah. system have a much larger amount of low income students that are there, in addition to middle income students that are struggling to pay for their tuition and their personal expenses. Mm -hmm. So when you put all of that together and you have such a high demand on food that's needed for students that we're already supporting with the free lunch uh, programs in K through 12. Mm -hmm. And most of these students are, are being raised in those environments, but then they get to college and there's no support whatsoever. And then they're being asked to subsidize themselves, but then we blind the true cost of attendance for public education. Mm -hmm. 
So when there's competing interests in the market, and then this conversation about food waste, and then you have this population that is increasing, being visibilized in the conversation that they need, that have the need, are these conversations happening with the governor? Are these conversations happening amongst leadership? And if they're not happening, how do we get them to start happening in a way that honors and is respectful of all of those three things? Because I'm very, I'm very much conscious of the politics. We need to make some type of capital in all this conversation. But at the same time, there's this massive food insecurity across our state. And it's even larger when we start creating data about college student food insecurity. How do we have that conversation in a respectful, honor, honoring, and strategic way? Because at the moment, we're not, yeah. uh, from my standpoint. So I wanted to make sure that from your standpoint, is this yeah. going on amongst leadership, or is it not going on amongst the, leadership? This is, this is happening in a couple different ways. But I will have to say the college student piece of this um, has not been visible and hasn't been a center point of the discussion. So this is a very important conversation we're having right now. There's a couple of things that we've been working on and still haven't been successful, and part of it is um, just the um, ethnic diversity in our state and so many immigrants to our state that won't, have not taken advantage of like our CalFresh program. And USDA has, has said, 80 different ways to Secretary Dooley and myself. How can we expand the use of this program that is it's a safety net and that's one of the most important things, helping people be more productive and healthy and all those kinds of things. So there's some new conversations happening around that specifically, which I think we need to think about college students as a part of that um, kind of system. Uh, but then the other one, and this is the one that you invest in early, but you hope that it has lifelong habits that come out of it, is the work that we're doing in the school lunch program. So this is, this is really helpful for me to hear your perspective on the college student piece of this and to make sure that it's not being left off the table because we're exclusively focused on families in certain parts of the state. The one piece I didn't talk about today is the work that we're doing on food waste um, and bringing together some additional work around that, including a food waste roundtable in Sacramento that's got a lot of policy people and business people. So our state now has a mandate to divert 75% of our organic waste from landfills. And so the, our administration's response is uh, citing at least 100 new compost facilities, well-run, cited in appropriate places, compost facilities. But also thinking about where is the demand for this, which is part of our Healthy Soils Initiative, which is how do we get more of this organic matter into places where normally they'd be buying synthetic fertilizer? How do we marry up without totally blowing a hole into the carbon footprint of moving it from places where it's generated to places where it can be used, in, in addition to the dairy digesters, which with the new technology can get this really great soil amendment out of that. So th the food waste is being attacked on that way. Some of the solutions, I just saw a draft of a letter that the round table on food waste is doing, and it's really telling USDA to do stuff that they're already working on. But one of the issues is labeling the best used by, um, don't sell after the consistency in those labels would be a big piece of the food waste on this as well, especially if there's an opportunity for more of that food that's actually still nutritionally good getting into the hands of people who need it. We have a great partnership with the state board and food banks to be able to take whenever you get, because Mother Nature or markets aren't there, that we get it directly from the farm into food banks. And we're close to 200 million pounds a year that we've been able to grow that program to. Yeah, and I would say uh, thanks to uh, President Napolitano's leadership in creating that global food initiative here on the UC campuses. Yeah. I think we're just now going to start seeing some new opportunities there. Uh, as example, I was just on UC Riverside campus late last week, and they've done this phenomenal program at Riverside where uh, they've got students gleaning, they've formed food on-campus food type clubs, and they've created their own on-campus food bank that is open to anyone. They, they wanted to not make it a stigma, so anybody can go. Ruben has done the same here. Oh, we've got the same here, okay. okay. I haven't seen yours. Yeah, okay. okay. In fact, so, not like, just Ruben himself. There's a team. About policy. Mm -hmm. The issue is that we can grow food on our campuses, but we can't feed the students because regulations and policies don't allow for that food to go into our student populations. So we'll clear it for somebody else, but we're not allowing for students to do that. Like even here at Berkeley, I know that it's been like for 18 years we've been trying to get on campus gardening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's no. It's a, is it a UC or is it a state policy? I don't know. Well, what, we'll figure it out. I get to ask okay. 
<laughs> I think, no, I think you, it's you a good question, question for both of us. To I look think at it too. is. Yeah. We got one more question in the back, and, and then we're I'll make running. it quick. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm from Brazil, and we're way behind on uh, organic farming and sustainability. We also had a major drought these last few years. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, well, I'm starting a nonprofit with a friend, and we are working on agricultural education, but I'm really interested on the, the from the perspective of institutional funds allocation and how, like for California, the state, what, what are the funds that have sort of been invested in organic farming and agriculture and developing the markets and how I'm interested in that because I'd like to sort of pressure the states that I'm working with to to develop, to make those uh, commitments. And uh, so if you could speak high level so, about yeah. that sort of So thing. I'll be real quick on this. Most of the funds themselves have come through the Farm Bill, um, through the organic program in the Farm Bill. Uh, research funding finally got increased in the last Farm Bill. Um, and the work um, that Secretary Vilsack has directed through Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, and that's made some additional funding opportunities available for organic. The state traditionally has not offered those kinds of support programs. Um, who knows the variety of reasons? Um, but the state was the first state to have a state organic program. It was about establishing a program with standards that consumers could have trust in. And having that in place helped let, lead to the National Organic Program being established. So it also, I think, helped create the market signal for growth in that sector. Um, and for the last year and this year again, under our specialty crop block grant program, we are specifying um, assistance to farmers making transition from um, conventional to organic. If there are some great proposals on that, we'll take a look at them. And then, in the, was it the 2008 Farm Bill was the first one that actually provided a subsidy for the certification process? Was yes, that an 08? 2008. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that provides some support because you're paying, I should know this since we have the organic program. Is it $600? $800? Okay. <laughs> no, neither of the, no, none of the above. So that's another assistance program that happens at the federal level so that wherever you are, you can take advantage of that. And, and I will add that um, I was in Brazil in August, and part of the, the follow-up to that is uh, we are hoping to announce, uh, hopefully in January or February, uh, an, a, a Fulbright, U.S., UC Fulbright chair for Brazil, where mm -hmm. we'll have scholars from Brazil up here who in, oh. in particular are interested in, in some of our research and how we do cooperative extension out on the ground. Uh, in addition to that, we've also got the UC Mexico mm -hmm. initiative that President Napolitano's kicked off, and mm -hmm. CDFA has been a very strong player mm -hmm. in, in trying to help you know, improve how we're sharing information, practices, techniques between UC and, and Mexico. So several, several efforts like that going on, and not just those two countries, many, yeah. many countries. Yeah. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, and this has been a great conversation. Yeah. But uh, please join me again in thanking Karen for being thank here with you. us today. Thank you.